Good evening, everyone. Crazy. Hello. What's shaking, man? How are you doing? Oh, pretty, pretty good. Good, man. Good, man. You look good. You look well lit. <laughs> your lighting, your lighting during our daytime hours is daytime lighting, and you have a lot of windows. I haven't seen you at this time of uh, of day where you have all your interior lighting. You look well lit. Yeah, I've been through a couple of these in the past. I didn't think we were going for the the 1920s bar scene. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, man! I like it. I like it. It's interesting. I love it. Hey, Kim, how are you? Hey, I'm doing well, Jared. How are you? Rocking. I'm doing great. I'm doing good, great. Good, good, good. Your to lighting like is November. marvelous, too. <laughs> my, lighting, my lighting needs some work now. Now I feel, <laughs> feel that I'm under, underlit now. How are you? No complaints at all. I'm riding in the car, so I have a little background noise. I'll mute myself so I don't disturb, but um, looking forward oh, to the meeting. Yeah, sure. Hey, Tanya. Hello. So, curiosity question. Did y'all get the link earlier when I sent the post registration link? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, cool. I had a few people ask back, and I was like, did it go through? Did I did I hit the send button? You know, one of those days. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, yeah, I got it. Yeah, I got the, the email yesterday. Okay, cool. Tanya, maybe good. those people who didn't get it had blocked you and this is their penalty, see? Maybe, you know, we get we get contact all the time. Like people are like, okay, did I unsubscribe? And I'll go into the system and it, it'll be different things like a bounce limit and just stuff like that, you know, that it's almost like you got to go through and re-trigger the email or people will forget that they unsubscribed and all the stuff. <laughs> so. Hey, Brandon, how are you? Yeah, yeah. Great <laughs> to hear. So, hey, Tracy, nice to see you. Uh, how you doing? Thanks. Good, good. Thanks for doing this tonight. No problem. Just, just so let Jared me know when I should... Uh... Okay. Share and begin. <laughs> sure. We've probably yeah, got about sure. 10 more minutes because it's, you know, we're used to this, the first 10 minutes where people kind of kind of trickle in to begin, you know, so we say that 530 time for the launch and then give it till about 540 to start the speaker. So yeah, I'd forgotten about yeah. voting today. So I'm sure that's going to be uh, something going on too. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And so Tanya and I kind of fill the space like bad anchors just trying to ad lib <laughs> it's not it's not always great but but we we definitely give it a shot well i've gotten some feedback from the other board members that we're going to start taking turns on different things too and kind of kind of letting other people to get their feet wet in the moderator duty so i figure that'll be like a good thing idea. to give people a chance <laughs> so i like that idea yeah hi tori thanks for joining us tonight and i did see you had gotten your PMP recently. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Definitely appreciate it. And thank you for the, you know, words of encouragement that you sent my way. It was most appreciated. You're welcome. So hopefully this will be one of your one of your first PDUs submitted. So kind of yes. get it in there towards renewing that cycle. So awesome. And hey, Beth, I see Beth on here. So Beth is actually a disciplined agile champion with PMI. Okay, I saw that she actually, all right. And Chad, so. So we actually had um, a guy named, for those of you that don't know, a man named Lee Lambert, who was one of the founders of the PMP, actually helped to promote this, this meeting. So we actually had about 184 registered. So it's always interesting. I mean, this year has been a very different year for us. I mean, with all of the virtual and we're just seeing the traction to see who signs up 
you know, and kind of what percentage actually shows on the night of. So it's been anywhere from about 50 to about 75% from what I've seen. So. So how was the exam, Tori? What was the experience like? Um, so when I first started, um, I, I thought I was bombing it. Uh, <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to fail. Um, but after about question 11 or 12, um, I started to get more comfortable and get into the groove of things. And um, it really helped taking the breaks. So out of the 180 questions, they break it up into the 60 and then take a break, 60, take a break, and then the last 60. Um, so that helped. That was like a tremendous help to take the edge right. off. Uh, wasn't as overwhelming. Um, but I noticed that they asked a lot of agile questions and a lot of Pinbox 7. It seems like they're retiring the Pinbox 6th edition. I have heard that it's it's tough to kind of quantify what that looks like. I mean, I took mine in, in 2014. So there's been several different editions. And it's almost like everything you read said that it's not straight seven, but no agile, you know, or no, as in you've got to learn it agile, you know, and also a little bit of six as well. But I have heard that they don't use a lot of the formulas that what that was kind of something that we used to see several years back was heavy concentration on like earned value and things of that nature. So. Oh yeah. I studied those the day before with my mom, like just so many times. And then I had no formula questions whatsoever on the test. So right, right. Uh, definitely what you're saying is accurate. Did you, so you did a lot of like exam questions beforehand just to make sure that you were scoring high, correct? Or did yes. Okay. Um, so I kind of like researched and it said to like try to get 80% or more on the practice exam questions. And I was hitting about 83, 86%. So I felt pretty good going into the test. But like I said, those first couple of questions just kind of took me aback and uh, I was nervous, but it, it worked out. Good, good. And I'm glad to have you here too. So Oh yes, we got somebody else in the group that's studying, although she's studying for her program management. So I was about to say, it's interesting to hear what her experience was, and I don't know if you've done that or not, but it would be great if you can journal everything that you remember, <laughs> including <laughs> how you felt, what you did, and if you would be willing to share that with the chapter, because it's those personal real life testimonies that would help take the edge off for the next person coming behind you taking a test. So I don't, you know, I don't, I, I don't mean to put you on the, on the, on a spot here, but it would be great if you could, you know, draft a little summary of what you thought, what you felt, what you experienced so that we could share that with others. Absolutely. No, for sure. I have no problem doing that. Great. Cause I'm sure it's fresh in your head and everything. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> Still there. <laughs> I don't know. For me, I felt like when I took the test, it was one of those tests that you studied for so hard. And then just all that panic of going in there. As soon as you're done with it, you're like, oh, I mean, I remembered a lot of it, but it was like I couldn't go back and tell you the exact questions that I took would be tough to quantify. Oh, God, no. They were all <laughs> page long. Each one had four <laughs> right answers and I had to figure out which one was the right one. And it's it's. That's the number one reason why I make sure to get my PDUs every every three years. I'm not going to do that again. Yeah, that's I'm right there with you, Jared. Just... Don't want to do it again myself. So, but I'm not doing that. Again. Like like Tanya, that that newer test sounds so intriguing. I can't quite wrap my mind around it because I'm like Tanya. I took mine in 2014 as well, so it's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Today is nothing like what it was when we took it. So, um, it's interesting to hear that it's a little bit different, but I think it's still just as anxiety inducing as back then. it's a very uh, different yeah with all the agile stuff now it's it's um it's a whole it's a whole different i mean it used to be that you know that that pinbach and agile were kind of the two different uh, the the differing schools of thought right within ppm you know we were coming at it from one angle and then you'd go and get a new job with a software shop or something like oh, hey we're an agile shop like oh my god I have to unlearn everything and then kind of relearn it. And it's interesting now how those those different approaches have converged. Um, and Pimbach has kind of, you know, adapted to encompass really that entire uh, that entire space. Um, but yeah, it's 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 
still a it's still a, a heck of, a, of an exam. So congratulations, by the way. Thanks. Definitely well appreciate it. Thank you. So. Hey, Lee. Lee, we Hi. were just talking about you. <laughs> I I hope not. Well, I said that you kind of boosted or promoted it, you know, and, and some of your friends have joined up as well. I was telling them a little bit earlier, we had 184 join and that it's always interesting the night of the meeting to see, you know, how many actually joined during the event and kind of track what those percentages are. I mean, you know, this year I've been doing the data of kind of tracking that to see what the trends are to, you know, project what things can look like next year as well. So, but uh all right. Well, I just wanted to start giving a little bit of just kind of general information to the group and, and welcome, you know, some of our people to do that as well. One thing I wanted to mention, and this is on the topic of elections, we are having chapter board elections. So everybody that is a member of chat, the chapter would have gotten an email on that on November 1st. And we've got the role of VP of Professional Development is up with Shala Canifax is running. And then for finance, we've got Sally Johnson, Tashika Dorsey, and Corey Ward. So if you are a member and you haven't taken the opportunity to vote yet, that's open until the 15th. So I would encourage you to please go back in the emails and look at that and take the time to vote. It would be very much appreciated. So, and then I actually wanted to call on our VP of membership, uh, Emily Ward, we're getting started a little bit early with planning some volunteer initiatives that are going to be taking place in 2023. And I wanted to give her a second to kind of touch on that and that vision. Hey guys, I am going to stay off camera. I'm a little under the weather today, <laughs> but I wanted to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, it looks like we've got folks from kind of all over in the chat, so it's nice to see all of you guys, and we appreciate um, you coming and taking a little bit of time out of your evening to hang out with us. Um, like Tanya said, we are gearing up for a really solid 2023 year. Um, we've already got our first volunteer opportunity on the books, so if you are available to join us, we'll be at the Greater Baton Rouge Food bank on Saturday, February 4th. Um, we will be volunteering with that group from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, it's four hours of volunteer work and it does count for four PDUs. So um, come hang out with us, um, network with some fellow um, PMI folks from Baton Rouge and give back to the community. I'm also going to drop in the chat a link um, to join our membership. It's $30 a year. And if you aren't already a member, please consider joining us. Um, you'll have access to all of our programming and, of course, these really cool events we get to do throughout the year. So I'm going to drop that in our uh, social links. So LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. If you aren't already following us, please be sure to do so. Um, and I'm going to bow out now. But if anybody has any questions, just reach out to me in the chat. And I'm going to uh, hand the mic back over to Tanya. Thank you so much, Emily. I appreciate that. You know, and that's that's kind of exciting for us, you know, because it's it's been a really long time since we've had the opportunity to do something outside of a structured meeting with a speaker, you know, to where the group actually interacts and volunteers together. You know, we've done some socials and some happy hours, but I think this is a great chance to get to know one another better, give back, and like she said, even earn the PDUs. Just kind of a final tidbit of information. If you are a member of the chapter, one of the perks, in, in addition to having the PDUs reported for you for these meetings, is that we can actually track our members' PDUs. So we can kind of help you with that feedback mm -hmm. or get in touch with you and tell you even different ways that you might can think outside the box to meet those certification cycles. So, Tanya, this is Kim. Um, there's some some questions in the chat. I can't really read them, but I know they're there and I'm driving, but I just wanted to make sure you did that before we started with the speaker. Okay, sure. Let me see. Uh, it looks like uh, Dana has got a question on, is there a recommendation for an agile course? So I would leave that to um, either Lee or even Beth to maybe chime in on if y'all got some good recommendations. Best the star. Okay, I will chime in. So it really depends on the, the intention. If somebody is just looking to 
really understand Agile, that's a whole different flavor of courses and study and, you know, even self prep that's available versus if you want a certification. And so if you're looking for to be an Agile generalist, the certification PMI has the ACP. Um, if you're looking for a little bit more discipline around lean and, and scrum and Agile, the discipline Agile Scrum Master is good for that. If you already have experience and you want a certification, the Senior Scrum Master is good for that. Um, so it's a kind of a, it depends answer, to be honest with you. Uh, and they can, excuse me, my voice is just not cooperating. They could reach out <clears throat> if they want to talk to me specifically through LinkedIn. I'd be happy to follow on. And I thought I saw somebody with a hand up. So somebody else. Uh, I did too. I saw, uh, I think it was Sabrina. I don't see the hand anymore, but, um, but Sabrina, did you have a question? Oh, I see. She put Udemy instructor, Joseph Phillips. So actually, I've, I've, I've taken a couple of Udemy courses and Joseph Phillips has definitely flown up on my radar, you know, and has got, got good programs as well. So. Okay, I guess with that, we can turn it over to Jared to introduce our speaker, Tracy Webb, tonight. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Really, really thrilled to see, you know, the kind of turnout that we've got here. Um, very, very excited about, about this evening's session. Um, Tracy Webb is someone I've, I've had the, the privilege of working with uh, for almost two years now. Uh, Tracy is the director of SecOps over at Global Data, uh, where I work. And, uh, you know, Tracy comes to us with, with really half a lifetime of military experience, very, very um, incredible, fascinating experience in the military, um, as well as in, in a number of sectors of the economy where, um, you know, he served across the landscape of organizations, uh, you know, all the way from, from the sea level, um, you know, to, to the, the technical and the operational level. Um, and it's it's really been um, it's been a fascinating experience for for he and I to work together. Um, I'm excited about the topic that he's going to bring to us this evening about change management. Uh, change management being the change that you need. Um, you know, this is a huge part uh, has been a huge part of our success as an organization at Global Data. Um, our ability to not only grow great product, build great teams but also uh, to scale those, right, in a way that, uh, that we can really come to the market with something, something large, something competitive, and something that's, that's been very successful. Um, so very much looking forward to this. Tracy, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, please, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jared. That was, that's going to be hard to top. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to be invited, um, you know, as Jared said, I've 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 done a, a half a dozen different things uh, in technology and the military and own my own business and things like that. Um, but to help me kind of guide my way through this, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, walk through my my uh, very diligently uh, recorded in my memory how I'm going to talk about this. There we go. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, sir. All right. So yeah, thank you again for inviting me. Uh, um, yes, my name is Tracy Webb. Um, I am a certified chief information security officer and I also have my certification in uh, information and system security as a professional. Uh, I'm a Navy Sp Special Warfare veteran. Um, I got out in uh, around 98 not including some reserve time because I, I and my wife had our first child, uh, my daughter. And uh, at that time, I figured it would be better that I uh, uh, become a father instead of jumping out of planes for a living. So I thought that was probably a better uh, way to take care of her and my family. Um, I've got around 30 years in communication, primarily in the military. I was a radio man in, in combat units. So I have a lot of satellite background cryptography, RF, and things like that. Uh, move through networking, you know, working in oil and gas and in ILEX and CLEX and uh, some MSPs and, you know, all throughout that journey because I come from a cryptology background and 
and the nature of military communications is always and always will be uh, secure comms. Uh, it was just a natural fit for me as a, uh, as a technical mind and as a kind of a sheepdog to move into cybersecurity where I feel like I could do the most good and, and help other people. Um, I'm a member of the Louisiana InfraGuard chapter. I'm a member of Louisiana's uh, Governor's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness for Calcasieu for that uh, cybersecurity unit, ESF-17. I'm a board member and director of uh, communications at Baton Rouge, ISACA. And uh, as Jared alluded to, I'm the director of information and cybersecurity operations at Global Data Systems, which i um, very happy to be there. It's been a it's been a real blessing to be there and, and work with uh, some longtime friends and and build some some really great products and uh, continue to build out some really uh, great reputations from over there in what we're doing in security and in MSP, MSSP in general. So that's my intro uh, to who I am. Um, why change management is a change you need. Um, you know, I'm a creature of habit and I've seen uh, throughout my career, at least, that the most effective teams and the most effective companies and the, the most effective uh, uh, areas of my career were always based around measurement of good and bad and how to make, how to perform change and how to find out what bad is and make it better. I mean, that's uh, essentially what every military unit is taught from the time you start folding your sheets all the way out to the, the battlefield is how to, how to find problems and solve them and how to do that in an orderly fashion to a process and a procedure that's recordable and measurable that you can repeat, right? So I knew this would be a very broad topic. Um, change management touches essentially every part of your, your business, your, your career, um, it, even parts of your life. I mean, I, I, I use this whether I like it or not, and whether my wife likes it or not in, in my, my life at home. So um, really, what, what is change management? Well, it's about dealing with challenges. Um, and that could be a challenge as a project manager, uh, you know, with, with a very large scale project or from a more technical standpoint, like we at GDS utilize it in many ways, we do daily change management. Uh, requiring our engineers and technicians to put through the changes they, that they want to perform on a piece of equipment or platform and have that vetted properly, approved properly, and then and forwarded on uh, for completion. So what, it, what is it in a broader scale for organizations? It, it could be operational, it could be technical, it could be project-based, but um, it's really about making businesses better. It's about making whatever you're doing better. Um, and organizations are going to have to, you know, begin to understand how to properly use change management because no organization can afford to stand still, right? Uh, if, if an organization or a business is not moving or not agile or not adopting or adapting to new, to new ways of doing things, they're left behind, right? So in every organization, you've got to be able to be agile and to do that effectively, you got to measure how to, how to go, how, what bad is and what good becomes, right? Movement means change. Uh, you know, what today or last week may be the best thing that your company does. You might sell a widget and then your competitor comes out with a widget equal or better to yours. So how do you compete with that? Well, a lot of times it's finding out how to make that widget better, faster and stronger and cheaper and then still maintaining your bottom line. So movement means change. And as we all know, change is a challenge. Human beings are not built for change. They like to be in the same place at the same time, every day doing the same tasks, uh, not necessarily having to think that hard about those, those tasks because it's, it's easier. And, you know, very human being, very few hum, human beings adopt or take on change very easily or, or, or successfully um, many times because it, it takes them out of their comfort zone, right? Successful businesses or operations adapt to change better than their competition. Um, again, company A makes a widget and company B makes a widget. And what usually decides what, what widget is going to make the most money for what organization is 
how will they how will they execute getting that widget to market and getting it sold right you got to find a, a way to measure that a better way uh change management uh and through those challenges that we meet help us find a better way to do things better is a measurable existence you know people talk about doing things better and yeah that can be an emotional statement but when you really get down to brass tacks for any operational plan or organization or business you got to find a way to measure better right to understand how to continue to make that better and repeat that process you can't be better until you can measure what your bad is there may be a process or a procedure that you're performing as a project manager that you've done for five years and it's working and uh, maybe you bump up against a project where the particular way a process or procedure you're performing doesn't work in that scenario well maybe maybe that's okay maybe it's time to understand that in the scenario you're in it's challenging you to find a better way to do that how can how do you do that well you got to you got to figure out what you were doing to begin with right so to do that you've got a plan uh, bad planning equals bad execution equals bad business so as you go from that challenge to find a better way you gotta you gotta put down on paper a plan to figure out what was bad and how do we get to good and how can we measure that again not emotional it's an operational decision it's a, pro, a procedural decision and you have to find a plan to measure what you're doing and then figure out how you want to make that better right forces for change that that's everybody in a in a small project management team that's everybody in an organization that's from the ceo down to the janitor everyone can be a force for change in a small team a large team or a multinational corporation uh, and quite frankly it has to be everyone pulling the same rope in order to make significant changes successful um, proper change management implementation requires vision right so people in the know people that are doing the thing have to have the vision to see look there might be a better way to do this then they need to communicate that they, they hey i think there's a better way for us to do this and communicate it in a way that enables people around them to want to do that activity to try the new way to to test their own boundaries and get out of their comfort zone to to work against change you have to understand that again people do not like change organizations are big heavy ships and if they've been doing something for a very long time or a four-man team has been doing something a very long time it's really hard sometimes to say yeah i know we've been successful but we could be better right because it's muscle memory and it's baked in that well hold on why are you trying to sh you know shaking the apple cart up here we've been doing this for three years we've been successful at doing it sure you have but maybe you don't know that we're going to take on new business we're going to take on 15 new clients and we've got to find a way to maximize your team or the organization's viable operational ability and to do that we've got to find better ways to do these things to, to measure what we're, how we're doing it and then find metrics to make change to change that and manage that change to get those successes accomplished or completed and you have to have buy-in and this uh, for me is you know i'll talk about it later is probably the number one thing um you can't force these kind of institutional changes or organizational changes on people overnight you have to you have to come at it with clear communication and vision you have to be understanding of the concerns they're going to have valid or not you still have to take those in as a factor in how you're going to execute and you've got to get buy-in and it's got to come from leadership every day through the stakeholders through the technicians the engineers the project managers the sales team everybody has to understand it and buy into the vision of doing something better through change management uh again i i'm sure you guys are as aware of anybody that there's a probably about seven million change management models or frameworks out there um that run the gamut you know that they were using in uh, ancient rome so uh it's very hard to 
really compartmentalize any of this at a level that, you know, doesn't sound kind of idiotic and, you know, oversimplified, but I've, I really break it down into four principles for change management, understanding, planning, implementation, and communication. Understand what? Understand what you're trying to change. What is it that you are trying to change? Planning. How do you plan to measure success? And that's, they all kind of blend together, right? Understanding what good looks like, understanding what you, the success you want to achieve, planning against that, executing it or implementing implementing it in a way that you can measure, and then, com and then communicating that throughout the, the organization or the team so that everybody has a buy-in and has a stake in, in, in doing whatever they can to prove the theory, to prove the theorem that we can do this better to align change management. So principle one, understanding change. Um, I'm not gonna necessarily read this verbatim, but it's pretty obvious, right? To successfully promote the benefits of change, you need to understand them yourself. So you need to think about it. You need to sit there and try to figure out what your objectives are. What are the key things I wanna get out of uh, this, this change? What am I trying to change? What's my objective to make it, to make more money, to make the process easier to learn? to be able to repeat it more easily, to measure it for compliance. There's as many reasons why changes need to be made and as there are key objectives. <laughs> I mean, and probably twice as many key objectives you're trying to meet. What will the change, of, what will the benefits of the change be to the organization? Again, we're not in the business, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. We all struggle and fight uh, father time in that way. So, it's also important to figure out, like, am I just doing this because I want to be the cool kid in class and and bring up a topic that will make me look like I'm a part of the team and, you know, toe the company line? No, that's a ridiculous thing to do. It just eats up everybody else's time. It eats up your time. It wastes valuable man hours and man days. So what you got to really be vested in the benefits of the change you're trying to bring to the organization. You got to really understand it yourself and be able to communicate it. How will it impact people positive, positively and negatively? And I would say that negatively is more important than positively because positivity, when you do these kind of exercises, uh, you, you can smell it in the room. You see that it lights up people's faces. There's going to be a group that goes, I've been saying we need to do this for two years. And then it's going to affect some others negatively because it's, again, human nature not to like change. And especially in something as task driven as change management, the first thing they're going to go to, this is going to make it take longer. This is going to cost more time. And that may be the case initially. But you look, you got to look out for those people that have a negative view of change and change management and really help them understand what the real use and positive force is behind it. How will it affect the people that, how will it affect the way that people work? It will. There's never going to be a situation where it will not, where it will not affect the people and the way that people work. But that might be the outcome you're looking for. You know, how do you want the people to work on that project? How do you want people to perform that process or task? Maybe the reason <clears throat> you're making the change is to increase productive value of a team or an individual or an apartment. What will people need to do success to successfully achieve the change? This is, this is something that gets vetted out in the, in the thinking of what you're trying to change. Again, in a, in a, in a project management group, um, maybe you, maybe that's the case. Maybe you're doing work for a client and you you're going into the, the last quarter of the year, except expecting you've got five or six site installs. And Oh, by the way, they come in and say, we need 20 before the first quarter of next year. Okay. So what are you going to do about that? You're not going to turn the revenue down. You're not going to walk away from the challenge. How can you manage that and increase you know, the, the operational tempo of your team and the impact they can make as individuals and team members, and how can you help them successfully achieve the changes you need to make to get that done? 
it's very deep thinking, but it's really what you've got to do if you if you want to take you know the challenge seriously and the success on as a serious possibility. You got to plan the change. Um, effective change just doesn't happen by chance. And nothing does, right? Um, the way that change projects are managed can vary from organization to organization. Um, in your individual organizations, you may find it that you need that maybe there's a need to really tighten up on some procedures and processes for a while, and you get really rigid with your change methodologies. You measure them to the nth degree. You have several reviewers of those changes uh, in order to kind of clean up uh, the process itself or the processes. There may be other times when it doesn't have to be so rigid. You just need a metric. You need to find a way to measure good, provide a metric to your boss or your management or the C-suite on how you're performing those things. And you just need ways that you can capture that data effectively through good ticket notes or project notes, and then have people review that so you can pass those metrics on. In general, you need to consider the following. Sponsorship. How will you secure, engage, and use high-level support and sponsorship of the change? Meaning, how are you going to get people to buy in? How are you going to get your executive team or your manager or the client to buy into the fact that you need to perform this change management on these particular tasks or processes, even though it may take another five minutes or another 20 minutes out of your day, it's gonna have value to them in the end. How are you gonna sponsor it? Involvement, who's best positioned to help you to design and implement that change? Will you need an external expert or can you use internal resources? Um, that depends on what you're trying to change, right? I mean, if, if you're the project manager and you're trying to do this, you should be the expert with that client if you have a lot of face time with them. You know what their needs and wants and desires are. You could probably be the one that leads that that initiative to figure out how to best design a, a way that you can measure change and provide a better feedback mechanism or feedback or OODA loop to them, right? Buy-in, 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 buy-in. Change is the most effective when you win support from people across the business. How are you going to do that? Again, uh, I know myself, I can't just walk into my boss's office and say, I got a great idea, give me $50,000. Doesn't work that way, right? I've got to go in there with a problem. I've got to go in there with a solution. I've got to go in there with a plan. And I've got to go in there with how I'm going to execute it, right? Effective thoughts to the, the objectives that you're trying to accomplish help you win over everybody in the room. If you're making common sense decisions about how to do something better that will have uh, an outcome that will provide you or the organization or your team a, a larger amount of success, it's almost impossible for somebody to shoot holes in that. And here's the funny thing. If you let them be a part of that conversation and they find some flaws in your system, you just want them over. Now they're going to be in, involved with it to help you make it better. Impact. Finally, think about what success should look like. Is it, again, is it more time? Is it less project uh, turnaround? Is it less people? Is it more money? And how will you predict and assess the impact of change you need to make? So if you feel like you, know, you're, you, you could probably scale down your project management team to meet that new 20 client order by the first quarter next year from three to two, just Look at the metrics, go find out how long it takes you to do a site. Can you really afford to source that third person into another smaller group to achieve the outcome and the goal? And if you don't know that yet, the first place you need to start is understanding what it takes to complete said site. What are the steps and processes and procedures you've got to go through to get a site turned up and lit and green and operational? Maybe you've never had to do that. But the only way that you're going to be able to, to talk about how you can be successful with some changes and or some, some realignment of, of staff or resources is proving your point to some degree. And you may have to go all the way back to the beginning of the rabbit hole to end up proving your point. Implementation of change. Um, again, 
there are there are way too many ways and way too many theories and theorems on how to implement change uh, and all of them are good in some ways and you can find problems with all of them in other ways and I really think what this always boils down to is what works best for your snowflake your group is a snowflake your organization is a snowflake right you are a snowflake your children your doberman pincher is a snowflake you know they're unlike anyone else in the in the space so you, you the research that it requires to implement that change really falls on some some taking some time to understand your goals and how you think you best imp can implement that change with the group of people or consequences or circumstances as you have to face um, ensure that everyone involved in the changes understand what needs to happen and what it means for them right so you want to say this is what we need to do and this is what good's going to look like for the team and for you what does it mean for you because a lot of times people want to know how okay what have you done for me lately right well maybe when we go through that process it's determined that okay well the fact that we're going to be able to really lock in on these processes make them repeatable make them recordable uh i'll be able to show the metrics to management that we we're going to get another team member which will free up some more time which gives you a little better opportunity to have a little looser vacation schedule or get you into a class that we haven't been able to get you into because of the amount of uh, work we're performing everybody needs to agree on the success criteria for changes and make sure that they are regularly measured and reported on this is key you can't be the only one in the room to decide what good looks like right it takes multiple people and, and multiple areas and multiple facets of whatever you're doing to decide what good looks like for them what's a win for them and then culminate all that into measurable reporting or metrics or gauges or, or glass in any way that you can find that you can repeatedly prove that or find out where you're not making the mark where you're not succeeding so that you can rinse and repeat that process until you get to the area you think that success looks like. Map and identify all the key stakeholders that will be involved in the change and define their level involvement. You know, we, we do a lot of mind maps at GDS and I find it invaluable and swim lanes invaluable because you never, ever, ever will know how many actual people touch a gadget or a widget or a process until you've done a mind map and a swim lane on the birth to death of that activity i would promise you right now that if you have not done one on something in your business you will be surprised to find out that you're missing a couple stakeholders maybe even a whole department and getting something done from a to z and produced of any value in your business and that's not a strike against anybody it's just that people get so lost in the sauce on trying to get it all done that they never sat down and really mapped out like what it takes to do that. And what you'll find out many times is that maybe you're burning the candle at both ends on too many people. Maybe, maybe some people are left out of that process or procedure of implementation that's costing the company more than you thought. There's a lot of value in really mapping out the key stakeholders in something that you're planning to perform changes with. Identify any training needs that must be addressed in order to implement the change. Sure, it's a great idea to use the the the, low, the tier one help desk to do uh, uh, high end engineering changes on firewalls. It'd be great. Can they? Has anybody trained them to do that? Or do they even know what their responsibility is there? Do they even have the access to get in the, the system or platform and do that? So. It's all a great idea to perform these changes and get stakeholders involved and pull in departments and get these projects rolling. But you also need to identify the fact and the reality that you might need to train some of these people up. You might need to train some of these people up on an operational part of the business or, or the, the thing you're doing, a technical piece, or simply just train them on what change management is again. Maybe they didn't get the message. Maybe it's not good enough to, you know, send out a company-wide email and expect everybody to read it and understand it. Maybe you got to train them on why you're doing this to begin with. Appoint change agents. 
who'll help you put the new practices into place and who can act as role models for new for this new approach, whatever that may be. Now, you know, <clears throat> I'm of the belief that we all got managers and we we've uh, you know, you got managers and supervisors under you, maybe, or maybe we've got managers or directors above us and C-suite and all that stuff. And true, you would wish and hope in a perfect world that every manager could be a change agent. Every supervisor could be a change agent. Every uh, every CEO could be a change agent. But that's the fact of the matter is that that's just not true. Um, some people have a, a real hard time um, being that kind of ambassador. Maybe they literally just don't have the time in their day. You've got them to buy in. They communicate it well. But what you really need is are people down the stack in the foxhole, if you want to say that, who can act as role models, who really understand why you're doing it, what are the processes and the methods to the madness that, that makes this all, makes this, is going to make this all work. So that they've got a question on the fly, they can reach out to those change agents and go, okay, I don't quite understand this piece of it. I don't want to screw it up. I'm scared. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. Tell me how to do it better. Right. So, You've got to have those kind of people in 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 every uh, area of your business or organization or your team. Find ways to change people's habits so that new practices become the norm. Uh, this one I'm going to leave up to you. <laughs> um, you got to you got to on large organizations. I got to be honest with you. I I find it hard to believe how they do this, in smaller organizations. It's really about understanding the people next to you and getting a relationship with the people that are involved in the activities you, you work in, right? Um, you got to know people's uh, uh, triggers. They're good and bad triggers. You got to do a little bit of social engineering on them to understand what, you know, what makes them happy at the end of the day. Um, because once you can find out what makes, what turns their crank or what makes them happy, or what makes them feel like they're they're producing or a part of the team, it becomes a lot easier to help them change the habit and buy in and perform these tasks that are so, so new to them at this point. Make sure that everyone is supported throughout the change process. So from the very beginning of talking about it, we got a new, we, we're going we're gonna to do this new thing. We're going to perform change management. It's going to involve some new people. It's going to involve some new processes. You're going to have to turn left when you used to turn right. All the way through that, even, even to the point of failure, you got to make sure that everyone is supported in that they feel confident in talking about where they failed, asking questions about how this really works, continue to communicate through that until there, there's a there's a sweet spot at the end of whatever this is, whatever thing you're trying to implement change management in, in which you'll know like, okay, 95% of everybody got this, right? They're on board with it. They know how to do it. They they know it well enough at this point that they'll find the flaws that we thought we were so, we were such geniuses in the beginning that we made this perfect change management model and it's all going to work perfectly. You'll know that they really start to be engaged when they start finding flaws that makes sense that you can use change management to change that's the change you need right you want to you want to get it all out there in, in the daylight find a better way to perform this process or procedure and when they start coming back with really impactful or questions about how this list doesn't look right and this could be done a little better you know you've got about 95 percent of them honestly to be put bluntly the other five percent you're just gonna have to muscle them into the process and make them do it. That's just like, that's what's going to happen. Finally, communication. Um, this is the biggest piece of it for me. Um, it, 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 I think for most people that are really, you know, really value change management and understand its need, understand its purpose from an operational standpoint, um, you really get out there and you got to communicate it daily. You, you in all the ways that you can um you got to talk about the change that you want to implement it has to be clear and relevant so people understand what you want to do and why they need to do it but set it with the right tone and and try your best to keep emotional reaction out of things from yourself to them and try to not elicit emotional reactions from the people you're trying to get make these things happen make these changes occur 
it's a good idea to leak these changes that you're planning uh, to your organization's mission or vision statements or the project goal or the client's uh, QBR or EBR. You know, link it to something that everybody has a stake in so that they take it serious and, and they see value in the success of it. It'll help people see how the change positively impacts, impacts the bigger picture or the bigger goal. It will also provide them with an inspiring shared vision of the future. Um, maybe not so much, but at least they'll go to bed at night going, okay, I've done my best today and tomorrow we can do a little bit better. Also be sure to practice good stakeholder management. This will ensure that you give the right people the right message at the right time to get the support that you need for your project, right? So there's, there's an art and a science to communication within any company. Who you talk to, when you talk to them, what you talk to them about, and it's just uh, how you communicate effectively. Um, you don't want to go to frontline, you know, level one knock techs and give them the big scoop on the big new thing at the company before you go to your directors and managers because everybody gets butt hurt and why didn't you come to me and you're not going down the proper chain of command. And so you got to be really knowledgeable and effective in how you communicate some of this stuff. Awareness, the need for change. Awareness of the need for that change, desire to participate and support in it. It's huge. Knowledge of how to change. Have you documented all your change management processes? Do you have a, uh, a review board? Is there a place that people can go to request that a change or, or process or procedure be reviewed? Ability to change, right? Uh, the funny thing about once you get in change management, really really clicking on all cylinders in an environment, you'll find that people turn to it because they begin to see the value in solving everyday problems. What used to be huge issues, once you get them in this methodical approach to these things, they wanna use change management to solve the problem and get it done. Reinforce, continue to reinforce its need and its use. In my personal opinion, if you can ever get everybody to buy into it and change management is really being utilized on a daily basis in your, in your company or your organization, it's, there's no need to reinforce it. It becomes a part of what they do every day. It becomes something that's a necessity that I found that I've gone to companies that didn't have quality change management. It scared me to death. I didn't know how they were getting things done. I was concerned about what was happening behind the curtain. What was the wizard doing? It, it just kind of blew me away how anything really got done and how they measured anything. And, you know, coming from a start, a couple of different startups, and that's, a, that's you know, coming from a startup is a, is a blessing and a curse. I love them. But in the beginning, there, there is no change management. You're just trying to, you're having ideas and you got to be agile and you're trying to produce value so that you can get to a point where you see, okay, we, we, this is how we can make this widget better and faster and stronger as a startup. And you're actually writing, you know, I, we like to say around GDS, you're building the plane as you're flying it. That's what a startup is, right? And if you're doing that right at towards, you, if you've done a couple of those and you've been through some companies that actually had change management, you can find those sweet spots where towards the end of it, you be, then begin to document your successes and then the changes make the change management falls into place. And it, it, it's a really sweet move, right? But for some people that have never experienced a startup or a company that utilizes change management effectively, it can be tough. So proving the point of the process. Um, everybody's seen the pyramid. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, you know, again, I think that it's it starts with a good foundation. And it starts with communication and understanding across the community, across the organization of the business. A fully communicated message from leadership down is key. It's like building a, you know, a house on sand and, you know, or without any foundation if you don't do that, because you'll never really get it off the ground. You'll never really see its value. People will push back against it to the point that it will cause civil wars within the <laughs> your departments and that's just not where you start so starting with understanding and fully communicating the message is 
is absolutely the key to all of it. Willingness, a willingness to buy in and work towards a shared goal. Again, that stems from communication. Why are we doing this? We haven't done it before. We haven't done it in 20 years. Why are we becoming this company and why are we doing change management now? It takes more time. It takes, it, 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 you know, it took me another 35 seconds to click that ticket. That's a value I've lost. You got to change the, the, the dynamic there. You got to, you got to communicate that it's okay if we lose a minute or two here, because we're going to make it up in a repeatable process by hours by the end of the year, right? So a continued willingness to, to communicate and to get people to buy in and work together towards that shared goal, which should be success, whatever, however you measure that. Continue to active, you know, make sure people are actively participating in it. Monitor and manage participation in the process. It's not good, it's not good enough, unfortunately, yet, even though we all work for, with, uh, many of us work with, with adults, um, and we work for companies and we're all very professional uh, when, the, you know, people will still try to get away from the pain. They will run from change because it is uncomfortable, right? So you have to find ways to monitor and manage that participation of the process to ensure that everybody is doing it. Worst thing that can happen is you've got a core group of people that are really, you know, towing the line, really putting their energy in to do this change management to have another group which just actively don't because it, it just brews a level of discontent that, that people can't operate under for very long. So you got to identify those things and, and nip them in the bud pretty quickly. Advocacy. You got to talk about the wins and losses and making the whole process better through its use. Again, what I see over and over again, we, you know, wherever I've been and done this, it's hard in the beginning. You got a few outliers, some naysayers, and uh, towards the end of it, you got about 95% that's involved with it and, and, and preaching to the choir about its wins and talking about how, hey, you know, I'm glad we had that change management document stored in our ticket system, or I'm glad that we done it that way. That way uh, we could tell the client, no, 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 we called you before we made, we made that change or turned off that gadget. You begin to, the wins and losses begin to show up and the losses become easier to fix because you have it documented you know why and where it failed and then you can make the necessary steps in the change management process or or the procedure that you're performing to get it fixed driving keep driving it advertising the reasons the needs and uses of successful change management in your organization i'd be willing to bet that all of you guys have taken part in audits or some kind of compliance uh, uh activity or an accreditation uh, of some kind in your career at one point in your career in every single one of those cases if you didn't have change management i don't know if you passed your audit or you've been told you've got to get a change management process in place so that you can mark down what you're doing about these kinds of activities or processes or procedures in your business so that can be measured so that they can talk to you about you have met compliance or you are accredited because you know what you're doing and you've got proof of that because you've shown the metric to us through your change management process. And that's it for me. Um, like I said, I'm a bit, whenever Jared came to me and said, you got anything you want to talk about? Honestly, I know I'm a nerd. The first thing that came to mind is change management. Um, and it's because we've worked so hard at it at GDS the past few years. Uh, I've seen it from a cybersecurity standpoint, uh, truly, probably, it's probably one of the easiest things that we could have done to affect a huge amount of hardening and risk, lowering risk in, in GDS from the very beginning, with not a whole lot of having to add an additional OPEX or CAPEX to, to the company, right? the pieces and the players and the people were already there. Um, it was just us implementing change management. They already had a, a, a form of it. They had been using it for several years. We took that and uh, put it on steroids. And I think effectively that, it, you know, it kind of shifted our dynamic and, and lowered our risk probably almost overnight. It would, would not, I would not be lying if I said that. And uh, it's just one of the easiest ways that you can affect whatever, again, 
whatever change you're trying to affect, if you go through these processes and you get dedicated to it, you're going to see success out the other side of it. So thank you very much. I wanted to ask just, and, and this is kind of based on your experience, you know, so you've had this experience with GDS, but how long would you think that it would take most organizations? And I know this depends upon size of the group to, to get to a medium or a mature state where they actually embrace it. Like in y'all's experience in GDS, how long did that process take? Well, I, I, this is tough, right? Because, you know, Global Data Systems is a, is a company of nerds, of techs, of engineers, um, of highly technical people, right? Um, and you would think that there's not as much emotion with those people, but you would be wrong. <laughs> there is a lot of emotion with those people because they're truly, uh, they truly love their craft and they believe what they're doing. You, you have to have a certain level amount of ego as a top tier engineer. Um to do the work we do, right? You have to have a lot of belief in yourself. So it, it, I, I'm not gonna measure it against another co any other companies and from a technical standpoint, from a tech IT company standpoint. It took us about, from implementation, you know, beginning of it to actual implementation. And it was because I had gone through this and uh, several people on the team had gone through this. Um, we knew already knew some of the pitfalls, so we we took a long time in talking about it, mapping it out, discussing what they had been doing before, trying to map as much of the new change management process to the old as possible where we could, so it, it wasn't completely different, right? We weren't going from a Corvette to a Volkswagen in their head. <laughs> um, it all kind of seemed familiar. But again, they had a, they had instituted certain levels of it in certain parts of the company for many years. For us, it took us about a year to get what I would say mature at it from birth to, you know, the when I was like, OK, I began to see the the uh, the 95 percentile, you know, it went from like 80 to then it would go back to 50 because it got one thing happened and everybody got mad about it and. And then, you know, we had to drag it all back in the sunlight and go, no, this is what we do now. We take this part of it, we investigate it, we do a postmortem on it, and we just change the change management. And it, it took a while for them to finally recognize like, oh, wait, we can change the change management? Yeah. If the outcome is us wanting to be more successful and we're not, we're not tied at the hip with a bad idea. If we, if we see that this has been not working the way we want, we can literally take the dry eraser and take away what's bad and put in what's good. And that's our new change management because we documented it, right? But the change management board, we documented it in our, in our procedures. And once people really begin to clue in like, oh, okay. So I, I have a say in this. If I see something that's completely asinine and everybody else agrees, we can fix that. Yes, you can. That's when it turned the dynamic changed, and everybody really began to buy into it. Was it was it in place before? Was it was it pretty steadily in place before the pandemic? And kind of what disruption? I mean, I imagine that there was disruption to getting back to anything, but no, it was. It, it was enough in place, and that's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up because I had never thought about that. And now I'm going to add it to my next <laughs> my next discussion. Uh, but it, we had it in place enough that it was working well. We, whereas before we were having weekly arguments during the cab call about you know whatever. Um, by the time the pandemic flew around or came around, we had gotten down to like once a month somebody being mad about something. And I think it. I think at least I'd like to believe that having change management in place probably helped a lot of people feel a lot more calm about their job in general. And like, it gave them a place to be steady and like a safe state where everything else is upside down. You know, at least at work, they had this and they knew how to handle it and knew what the process was. And um, that I think that probably did help a little bit. I think it, I hope it did. I'd like to believe it did. That's a really good point. I mean, it sounds like the way that y'all go about it 
definitely encourages radical transparency, which is good. I mean, it's not something that every organization is used to, and some of them don't like hearing it. But I think, you know, having those those stand-ups where you really kind of air things out and different people look at it from a different angle gives the group a better chance I, to work with. I think it does. And I, th I think that the, like the collateral win is it trains people. Um, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't think that just like my team as a, from a security standpoint, if anything security related comes through for change management, one of my engineers is, is required to review the procedural documentation, right? But they also have to know enough about what they're doing in the gear to make a, to make a determination on, is that the right thing to do or not, right? So it's kind of like a free escalation point for the, everybody to, first of, all, like, first of all, get your work checked. Like, okay, does that look right? On my end of it, my guys don't spend a lot of time in that equipment. We do other stuff. So they get to keep their knives sharp on looking at route switch stuff or firewall stuff and keeping it present in their mind. And, and I think it's helped. I think it, there's a training aspect to it that many people probably didn't believe was going to be there. But I think that that's another side win to, to using it as as because we do everything through change management. You know, I'm not going to say we don't capture. There might be something slipping through. I hope not, but um, on a like a busy week, we might go through forty change management requests mm -hmm. um, of every ilk, you know, from a white list of an email address to a major outage need for a large scale client. Um, and the visibility that's out there, I, I think maybe Jared would agree. Like it keeps. I think it would probably keep the sales guys a little more informed and feel a little more comfortable that we're not just flipping the switches off on stuff without good reason, without proper notification, all those things. And you just can't do that. You, you know, you can't do it any other way without that kind of transparency, I think. No, I think that's, I think that's a great point. And, and, and Tanya, you, you, uh, you said a word that I love, which is radical transparency, right? You know, one of the things that I think emerges out of out of strong change management um, <clears throat> is that sense of radical transparency, right? You know, myself being a member of the accounts team, one thing that I'm that I know is that there's there's copious documentation on everything that we do um, within security operations, within our operations team, really across our organization. Um, you know, one of the things that that um, that's been a great uh, you know, asset to me, just in help, you know, being able to help my customers, being able to keep them happy and answer the questions, et cetera, is learning where things are, learning where to find the information that I can use to answer questions. Um, and because of that sense of radical transparency, right, because of that, that sense that everything I do is subject to, at some point, a microscope, whether that's right now, whether that's a week from now, or whether that's a month from now. Right. The idea that, you know, if if I don't follow my method, if I don't follow my procedure 100 percent today, it doesn't you know, if I get past whatever I'm dealing with today, that's fine. Right. I'll get this. I'll check the box. I'll get this issue out of my way. But it's a week from now, a month from now, a year from now when someone can go back, you know, and, and in solving some other problem, we start to unearth that I didn't follow procedure, that we unearth that a problem that occurred a year from now was caused. Right, the root cause of that issue was not following a procedure that I should have today. Um, that creates that next level of of transparency, right? But as an account manager, you know, knowing where the documentation is and the ability, you know, the, the knowledge that it's all there, that I can always go to that, grab it, and use that to help customers. Um, you know, that's an that's an amazing asset. So, um, you know, that's that's been my experience, right? Obviously the immediate reaction because i came from startup you know tracy talked a lot about the startup space earlier how you know these are kind of two ends of a pole right you know in the startup space there's a discipline around innovation that looks and feels very different from how we're describing change management now right there's a discipline that's that's around trying things testing things does it work if not loop back it's a very rapid thing it's like something you do before breakfast right, right in the startup space where change management is how do we take a big organization that's got an established market presence 
and create products and deliver services to that market um, at scale, right? But with the same efficacy and with the same, um, the same eye toward innovation that we do in the startup space. And as someone who came from the startup space, you know, the adaptation to that level of, um, of change management, right? Not easy. Right. It, come, it comes with a certain amount of, of, of adjustment. But uh, yeah, I mean, to, to Tracy's point, I can absolutely say that, you know, as someone who, who's directly customer facing in that kind of environment, change management gives me a lot more tools than I'd have otherwise to, to be a better asset to those customers. I'm looking through to see. It looks like we've got a lot of a uh, lot of information going on in the chat. One shout out to GDS was from Tori. She was saying when she studied IT at SLCC, everyone aspired to work at GDS. A lot of people are giving feedback. This has been a very great topic. Um, Sabrina pointed out that COVID caused a lot of changes to occur. They had to implement a virtual new hire orientation versus in person. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, I think that that was one of the, um, that I, that was one of the weak spots that, that even we had that I think COVID kind of pushed us into as an organization was one remote work in general, right? And the other was proper onboarding and change management and the use of, uh, structured SOPs and mops and those things, those words that you guys are really familiar with um, was, has been paramount in us being able to learn how to do that better um, regardless, in-house, remote, whatever. And I think that because of that and, so, you know, some other larger scale decisions that executives made and leadership made, you know, global data systems was able to go through the pandemic without firing a single employee, laying anybody off, I come out the other side with positive EBITDA values. And now we're going on our third and hopefully we'll have four uh, positive revenue quarters this year, right? Um, and I don't think that we could have accomplished that had, you know, the, the, the kind of the edict, edict that we listen to, you know, from our chief operating officer a lot at, at the old data systems is follow the process, right? Change management, follow the process. And it, it get, for everybody, I can understand why that gets to be like an annoyance, like, oh my God, don't say that again, right? But it, it really is when, when the, you know, again, I'm a military guy, when the bullets start flying, processes feel really comfortable because you don't have to think about them much. You just remember them because you've done them a hundred times. They worked before, you know, and the process is going to be there to save you no matter what, right? So, you know, that goal all goes back to change management. But I, I, I like what she talked about with, you know, on the fly implementation, huge place for change management to be, you know, be a part of and uh, go back and, you know, like record that and see what you did right and make it better next time. We do have another uh, question in the chat from Tori, just asking what are some conflict resolution techniques that would be recommended when implementing change management for those that may be resistant to change? Um, I mean, really, it's just making them a part of it. Um, and then, so you're always going to have the tough egg. <laughs> you're always going to have that individual, no matter what you do, right? Yeah, I mean, they're just going to be the tough egg, right? Um, but again, if, if we're talking about rational professionals that, that are willing to see the outcome as a success, right? It's making them a part of it, dramatically making them a part of it, right? Again, our world is very technical at GDS. And those instances where, you know, maybe we were doing something, writing an SOP that would be used for a standard change, a standard change, if, if you guys aren't as you know, learn it in this as I've had to become is basically something you do all the time. You repeat it over and over again a lot. It doesn't necessarily require a cab board or somebody else to go over it and, um, you know, verify it necessarily at a higher technical level. 
it can just be done quickly reviewed and, and done quickly right it doesn't revolve or it doesn't resolve it doesn't take a whole cab team to look at that change and vet it right um we have we had a couple of people that were you know long-time employees that had a real bug about change management they were highly technical people very valuable engineers so rather than fight that I just pushed as hard as I could to get them intimately involved with it, make them a stakeholder in it, right? Put them in the middle of it and say, okay, I know you're smart. I know you're a problem solver. I know you're a critical thinker. I know you're an engineer. So let's solve this problem, right? And what I found, do that if you do that a couple of times and they're like, okay, they've contributed, they've gotten their energy out, <laughs> their creative energy out on that problem, they feel like they matter. They feel like they're a part of that process. They made an impact very quickly. That, that's a, it's a non-issue. It, they, it becomes just something else that they maybe were having a bad day, a bad year, a bad week or whatever. They got over and they're better now and they can move forward knowing that they have a voice and they have a way that they can implement. Uh, they can impact the, whatever we're doing in a positive way. Thank you. Let me see. And then I see something from Wizzy saying, is this where upper management can support? Isn't this where upper management can support the change? I yeah, I mean, you, you might have to go there. I mean, you might have, there might be, have to be um, intervention, uh, some quiet counseling <laughs> that, that may be, that may be needed. Um, me, you know, I'm a knucklehead. I'm a hardhead. I don't like having to bring my, you know, I feel like every time I've got to bring a battle to my, my boss, I, I feel like I'm a loser because I'm a mental patient. <laughs> so I always try to handle all that as quickly and as fast as I can up front. But I've also learned that, you know, sometimes it's better not to fight that dragon, throw the dragon at him, let him fight the dragon. That way me and the dragon can have a hug later. So that has, that's happened quite a few times too. <laughs> that's a good analogy on it. <laughs> so. Well, we still do have some time for additional questions. Okay, David, I see, has OCM been practiced or aligned with, has organizational change been, been practiced or aligned with this discipline? The, 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 David, do you mean at global data systems actively today or I, i'm sorry if if that if if you're asking if gds uh uses organizational change management day to day i would say in in many ways yes um through our focus projects and things like that um yeah, yeah. It, for those that you may not under, know what focus is, essentially, it's it's where we get our team together. Usually, directors or above, or managers and above, and with our chief operating officer, and we produce project request forms. Um, especially if they're going to touch more than one asset, or gonna, you know, member of a team or department within the company for new ideas, uh, innovations whatever the problem we may bring, we bring it to focus and, and, and run it through the focus process in the, in that engine, that innovation engine, and try to make figure out the best way to skin the cat for lack of a better term. Um, and through all of that, there's a lot of uh, organizational change management that's, that's handled through tickets or through meetings or mind maps or things like that. But it's, it's, it's definitely, loosely fitted into the fabric of focus kind of like kind of like uh backlog grooming but much bigger yeah with a with a much larger participant pool <laughs> Well, I did want to take uh, take the chance to mention the claim code. I put it in the chat a little bit earlier, but just the PDUs and reminders that for members of the Baton Rouge chapter, it'll be reported for you within three to five business days. 
And for those of you that are guests of the chapter tonight, which thank you to Lee Lambert for reposting the message. We always appreciate those shares on LinkedIn and new people joining us. That claim code is C106S3T7XN. So, and it's also in the in the co in the uh, in the chat. This recording, we should have a copy of it up on our YouTube channel on our website. Um, probably by the end of this week, that'll be that'll be out there. And just a reminder to any of you that may not know, we've had a YouTube channel all year. So if there's some of you that are needing additional PDUs and willing to self-report, didn't previously attend the meeting, those are on our website through that YouTube channel back through January of this year. So, and I just, last little announcements, I, I wanted to mention that next week we'll have our in-person meeting at Opportunity Machine. That's going to be Dean Mallory on Thursday. Um, that's going to be the 17th. And then at the end of this month, Emily and I are going to be going to the Global Summit in Las Vegas. And so that'll be the end of the month for about three days. Hopefully we'll be able to bring you all back some great information, some great new ideas from that, and just kind of share that synergy with you. So if I could say one thing, I wanted to say, tell Mr. Dean hello and tell everybody on this call that Dean Mallory is probably one of the most gifted project managers I've ever seen work. So I just wanted to say that out loud in front of him and make him blush uh, if possible. <laughs> yeah, blushing. Is he on off. camera? Where's your camera, Dean? <laughs> Where's your camera, Dean? <laughs> yeah. All right, here I am. Thanks, Tracy. You can't, you can't take a comp there you are. You can't take a compliment like that over audio, man. Well done. Well, I, I'm looking forward to his topic. I mean, it's 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 a different spin, but it's based on his perspective of being a project manager in attaining financial independence by age 60. So I, I'm kind of looking forward to the nuggets of wisdom that I can pick up because if there is ever any chance to retire early, I would be off. <laughs> well, if he if he gives the combination to a safe out, let me know. I'll I'll uh, I'll, I'll be a, on that call as well. <laughs> well, actually, we just have, this one's in person. This one will be an opportunity um, machine down the street. So we usually get good food for it too. I try to bring either the Dino's pizza or something jazzy like that for for people that are able to show up in person. So. Yeah, you're welcome, Tracy, and bring uh, bring your friends. Bring Joey. He wants to, he wants to hear this. <laughs> I will. <laughs> okay. What happens if you're over 60 already? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's I'll okay, talk to you about, about what does it take to get to where you want to get to? You know, if you're past 60, maybe we can make it happen by 70 or 68 or we'll see. Wow. About 77. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the magic number? Uh oh. Yeah. And Lee, like how long did it take you to become like, were you doing this much traveling before COVID? Because I got to give a shout out to Lee. Lee is always going, 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 and in another country, in another state, and always on the move. Yeah, I, not, not as much as I have in the last year, year and a half since COVID kind of died down. But uh, I was home this week. Uh, these last two weeks, I was home seven hours. <laughs> Seven whole hours, huh? Yeah. Yeah, so it's getting crazy, but I love it. I always like following the adventures and seeing where you are. It's like, where in the world is Lee? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's going to be in Colorado in January, aren't you, Lee? Or February? Yeah, I think February. <laughs> is he, is he speaking for you? He's okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. So... And that's one thing I love about these virtual. So I just, I really wanted to say thank you to everybody that helps to put these together, the speakers and those of you that join us. I mean, it's just, it's been a really interesting energy to see how many people from different places come and connect with one another. And, you know, that's something that we're looking forward to still bring into the chapter in 2023. So I have had a few questions, are y'all continuing virtual? And the answer to that is yes. And we're still going to be doing in person too. We'll kind of 
look at the frequency of both, you know, Baton Rouge and Lafayette, see where that lands. And then there's also, you know, the volunteer activities and maybe some more social opportunities that we can have that are that are less structured. It gives a chance to know one another better and share some ideas. So. But thank you all for being here tonight and, and joining with us. And Jared, as always, thank you for helping moderate. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Oh, that's a great session. You, yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Tracy. Thanks, team, for, uh, for joining us this evening. Yeah, thank uh, you guys. Look forward to seeing you all again. Have a great one. All right. See you. All right.